Hello and welcome back to the last of these 32 talks about composing music. We've covered a lot of ground but we've never really asked ourselves why we do this and I can perhaps give you two reasons. The first is the sense of achievement, the fact that you can say I did this. And the second is quite simply I think that all human beings have a basic need and a desire to be creative in some sphere or other. And if you're a musician, well it's obvious that this is probably where you're going to find something that you can use. Now, there are two reasons why not to do it as well. The first is it takes an awfully long time. The second is you'll almost invariably look at what you've done and think, well, it's not as good as Beethoven, I shan't bother. Please don't get put off by this. Other people decide whether this is a good or a bad composition. You will always be dissatisfied with your own work. You're probably familiar with the old classical instruction, Know Yourself, and uh, you'll probably also know that it's that something that even great philosophers have said it's actually very difficult to do. But if you want to know something about yourself, what type of a person you are, I think there's nothing better than to look at your friends and say, well, these are the people I like to spend time with. I'm probably something like this. And similarly, with music and with composing, I do encourage everybody to look at the composers that they most like and to imitate them. But just imagine you were asked to choose 10 records of something you take with you. Well, what would be your choice? And this is probably the sort of thing you could be looking at more closer to just to get an idea of your own musical style. I don't remember much of my time at primary school, but two things do stick out that I'd like to share with you. One, I remember seeing a film about snow crystals and learning that no two are the same, although they all have almost the same structure. and They're very, very similar, but no two are identical. And the other thing is that every cell in the human body is renewed over the course of seven years. I've since discovered this isn't strictly true, but it is true for most of the cells, at least in the body. Now, the conclusion from this is that you and I, all of us, we are constantly in a state of flux, we are constantly changing, and there's nothing to stop us doing something completely new, that just only have it if we've never done it before. The other thing is, of course, this obsession with originality, and if you can free yourself from this, well the best way is just to remember that you're already unique, you don't need to try and be original. Now you may remember when we were talking about variations, I asked you to look at Beethoven's C minor variations. Now, as well as bearing a curious resemblance to La Folia, this is followed by 32 variations, the last of which is almost like three variations in itself, followed by a coda. This is followed by 32 variations, the last of which is a more or less three variations with a coda. So a composer at the height of his creative powers chooses to model a movement of a symphony on a composer who has dominated his whole creative existence. The curious thing about it is, of course, that the Beethoven is pure Beethoven and the Brahms is pure Brahms. I'd like to encourage you to compose a piece for your instrument, a concerto to play and to perform with your orchestra. Now, the pieces to look at, I would really recommend Mozart's clarinet concerto and then the violin concertos of Beethoven, Brahms, Mendelssohn, Elgar, Tchaikovsky, and look at all the concertos for your instrument. Then choose a musical style that you'd like to work in. Do some exercises, obviously on a smaller scale, just to get started. But then, there's nothing to stop you moving towards something like this on a really a large-scale project. Finally, I'd like to thank you for watching these talks, and I'd like to leave you with an exercise that Mozart did when he was 17. Now, he was not 
the mature Mozart that we know of his of his later works, but he'd already written some absolutely some milestones of works that would probably be better known today if he hadn't gone on to write even better things later. So at the age of 17, he took this little sonata you may remember we discussed in the uh, in in the 27th tour. This little sonata of, of Johann Christian Bach and restructured it and using the material on a one-to-one -one basis to make his own first piano concerto. And of course he went on to write the finest piano concertos probably that have still ever been, ever been achieved. In this example now, which you'll hear and see, you'll see the top two lines are the Johann Christian Bach score and underneath that is the Mozart Concerto. He only orchestrated this for strings and piano for himself to perform. It can be done with a very small ensemble. And it's, as I say, it's the best actual lesson for overcoming any inhibitions you may have towards uh, copying other composers. Please do use the material of composers of the past Obviously not just copying themes. You're not going to get very far by saying... Wait! <laughs> so not by that. And the, you're not going to far, get far saying this is an original composition by me. But if you can avoid just the thematic material of the composers, use their method and go underneath the surface to see actually what were they trying to say, how did they do this, how did they achieve this with the harmony and you'll probably write some very interesting and very exciting works. So, I'll leave you with Mozart and say goodbye for now.